Are you with us still? Are you hot this morning? <laughs> Whoever took our, uh, our, our air cons, we're going to pray them back again. <clears throat> We've been dealing with what we call the Olivet Discourse, and it's found in these um, scriptures over here, and it's where Jesus speaks about the end times. The disciples asked him a specific question, um, and they were sitting over there, and he said, tell us, um, when will this happen? What will the signs be of your coming and of the end of the age? And this, this is something that um, we are very interesting. You know, when, when's Jesus coming? What's going to happen? And all these things. And this morning, I want to deal with one of the aspects to do with it. Next slide. Um, one of the first aspects um, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 5, it says, um, Jesus answered, and this is the first statement he makes after the, the question. And he says, watch that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name claiming I'm the Christ and will deceive many. Um, anybody over here ever been deceived by somebody that claimed to be the Messiah? Nobody, okay. Um, anybody over here heard about somebody that said they were the Messiah, that they were the Christ, okay? So there have been people around and I googled, and uh, I came across some of them you could see were crackpots. Um, others were very deceptive, and some of them were interesting. And I want to just maybe put some of the interesting ones to you. The first one that um, we want to talk about is a, is a guy by the name of Moses um, of Crete. Moses of Crete was a Jewish Messiah claimant and a prophet in the 5th century. In other words, yeah, around the 400s um, AD. Um, and he lived, obviously, on the Isle of Crete. After the failed Bar uh, Kokhba War of 130 AD, there was a war. The, the Jews um, attacked the Romans, and they, for three years, um, they defeated the Romans in Palestine. But then the Romans decided, no, no, they've had enough of this, and it was failed. And there was, a, um, there was an end to messianic movements for several centuries. However, the hope of the coming Messiah nevertheless continued in accordance with one of the interpretations of the Talmud. The Talmud is Jewish writings about the Bible, um, explaining it. The Messiah was expected in 440 A.D., this expectation in connection with the disturbance in the Roman Empire raised hopes in a Messiah claimant who appeared about that time in Crete, and he won over the Jews there to his movement. He called himself Moses and promised to lead the people like the ancient Moses um, dry shod through the sea back to Palestine. Right? Now, please, do you know where Crete is? And you know where Palestine is? Uh, anybody want to guess that? We don't bring it up yet. Anybody want to guess how far Crete is um, to Palestine if you've got to walk through the sea? Anybody here? Uh? Come on, give me a guess. Okay, you don't know. Right, let me help you. As the crow flies. In other words, if the sea's got to open up like Moses, you're going to walk for a thousand kilometers from Crete. Glug, 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 glug. Okay, no, glug, glug. And um, you will get to Palestine. And, and this man sold the story um, to them. His followers, convinced by his claim, left all their possessions and waited for the promised day, upon which they followed Moses to a headland overlooking the sea, and at his command, cast themselves off. Many drowned and were destroyed on the rocks below. Then Moses himself immediately disappeared or got murdered. We're not quite sure what happened. That was in the 5th century. <clears throat> then we get another fellow. Um, anybody know who this guy is? <coughs> you don't know who he is? Well, let me 
help you. Let me first tell you, um, this guy is also another Moses, and he's a South African. Um, his name is Moses Ilongwana. And Moses Ilongwana, um, four years ago, he set up his compound with disciples as the reincarnation of Jesus Christ in South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal. Moses Ilongwana was announced. This, he proclaimed, was proof that he was the Christ and that he had spent many years in the wilderness for, before being resurrected as the Son of God. The former, listen to this, the former Johannesburg jewelry salesman immediately dubbed himself Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Accused of tearing families apart, Ilongwana said that he had spent 22 years in a fight with the devil and had overcome him. His disciples included aged pensioners who had signed over their entire benefits to Ilongwana. As I speak to you, I will never see death, he said. I will now getting ready for the opening of graves and the healing of blind and lame, Moses said. Last year, Ilongwana married one of his disciples, Angel. He then announced that his wedding day was the beginning of the end of days. Angel now goes by the title, Mother of the Whole World. The so-called Zulu, Jesus favors luxury surroundings, bright colored clothes, and gold jewelry. He has about 40 disciples. Next gentleman. <clears throat> Anybody want to hazard a guess who this man is? All right. Let me help you, seeing you don't know. Apollo Quibbleboy, born the 25th of April, 1950, is the executive pastor of the Philippines-based Restoration Church called the Kingdom of Christ. He has made claims that he is the appointed Son of God as well as being owner of the universe. The sect's main cathedral is located in Davao City. His followers refer to their community as the kingdom nation. They claim about 2 million kingdom citizens and 4 million in the Philippines. On weekdays, members hold Bible sessions and prayer services. On Sunday, a global worship is held at the cathedral. Quibba boy has claimed to possess divine powers, claimed to have stopped the 2019 Katabato earthquakes at his command, and said the public should thank him for the act. He has publicly said that he did not do the same to stop the onslaught of the typhoon Kamuri. His ministry has a global television channel, the Sunshine Media Network International, and 17 radio stations in the Philippines. He ha also has two newspapers with worldwide circulation. We're not talking about 40 disciples now. We're talking about 60, uh, 6 million. Right. Next gentleman. Does this kind of picture look familiar? Okay, you won't know who this guy is. Um, this guy is a Russian, um, and his name is Sergei Torop. And he goes by the name of Vas uh, Vasarion. Um, Sergei was born the 14th of January 1961 in Kandas Nodar, known as Vasarian. Vasarian means he who gives new life. Vasarian, a former traffic policeman in the Serbia, um, claims that on the 18th of August 1990, when he was 29, he had a revelation and 
He was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. He founded the church of the last testament with its head church located in Serbia. Vasarian teaches reincarnation, veganism, and apocalypse. Okay, end times. He has around 4,000 followers living in the settlement um, in Serbia and a further 6,000 followers around the world. Next gentleman, you might know who this one is. Anybody want to help me? Yes, what did you say, Tom? Moon. Right, thank you. Somebody knows this gentleman, okay? Let's hit him over there. Sun Mung Moon, born 1920, died 2012, and he is the head of the Unification Church, also known as the Moonies. Founder and leader of the Unification Church in, established in Seoul, South Korea, who considers himself the second coming of Christ, but not Jesus himself. Although it is generally believed by the Unification Church members, Moonies, um, that he was the Messiah and the second coming of Christ and was anointed to fulfill Jesus' unfinished mission. Right, next slide. Have you ever seen something like this before? Right, these are, um, and um, this is a picture of a um, marriage blessing ceremony run by this man and his church. Um, and um, you can see it's uh, just a handful of people, okay? Hit the next slide. Um, right. Have anybody have been married by them, blessed by them yet? Nobody over here? Okay. The marriage blessing, um, whoa, let me back up. 36 couples participated in the first ceremony in 1961 for the members of the early church in Seoul. The ceremonies continued to grow in scale. Over 2,000 couples participated in the 1982 one in New York's Madison Square Garden. I think that's the pictures that I showed you. Um, the first one outside of South Korea. In 1992, about 30,000 couples took part in the ceremony. And in 1995, hold your breath. 360,000 couples in South Korea. Now, what is this about? The Holy Marriage Blessing Ceremony is a large-scale wedding or marriage rededication ceremony sponsored by the Unification Church. It is given to married or engaged couples couples through its members of the unification church believe that the couple is removed from the lineage of sinful humanity and engrafted into God's sinless lineage. Did you get that? As a result, a couple's marital relationship and any children born after the blessing exist free from the consequences of the original sin. You can go and try and digest all of that, but believe me, um, this man never said he is the Christ but he said he was the anointed one, and he said, but now I'm not Jesus, but his followers looked at him as a Messiah. And when they came, 360,000 of them, to have the marriage blessing, 
that marriage blessing ceremony brought them under His control. And believe me, you do not want to be under the control of somebody that claims to be the Messiah. Okay. So now, Paul, what's the big deal about this? Jesus warns about all these uh, false Christs coming. Nobody over here, um, and many people that are going to be listening to me, have never fallen under the voice, under the ministry, under, of a false Messiah. So how does this affect me? Why did Jesus go about to warn us about something that it would have no effect on us at all? It's got nothing to do with us. If somebody comes and walks in over here and says, Hey, uh, my name is Jesus Christ, we will just say, Excuse me, there's the door. Cheers. Um, so, you know, we don't have this problem. Um, but I want to tell you, there are millions of people around our globe that do have this problem. We have many people around our globe that worship anybody but Jesus Christ. Is that correct? In other words, they will worship Buddha. They will worship a Hindu god. They will worship anything else but Jesus Christ. There, there are other religions out over there. There are other religions that, you know, you come along and you talk about Jesus this religion will talk about Jesus as well, but the Jesus they're speaking about and the Jesus you speak about are two different persons. When they speak about Jesus, a Jehovah's Witness, He is not the Son of God. He's just a Son of God. He is just a normal man, another prophet. He is not Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh. And that's what we believe. And so we, we kind of say to ourselves, and we, when we read this, we'll kind of brush over it and say to ourselves, okay, that's not got to do with me. And I just want to say to you, just one little question this morning. Oh, hit the next question over there. Could it be that we just worship ourselves. We just love ourselves. We might not love old Mr. Mooney and his church. We might not love, um, you know, old Mr. Moses and um, a couple of others. Um, but you know what? Could it be? Could it be? this thing doesn't worry us, got nothing to do with us, but hey, could it be that I just love myself? Well, let's hear what the Word of God has to say. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 2, Paul writes to Timothy and he said, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Remember, the last days are from the coming of Jesus Christ until He comes again. And then verse 2, he warns Timothy and he says, People will be lovers of themselves. Now, is there anybody over here that doesn't love themselves? Is it so wrong to love yourself? Isn't the problem in our world that we don't love ourselves enough? Because you know what? If we really loved ourselves enough, this world would be a better place, wouldn't it? And so, you know what? I got onto Uncle Google as a good friend of mine, and I Googled. Google, what are the signs of somebody that loves themselves? And you know what? Google just threw a whole lot of stuff at me. Some of the signs were Ten signs that you love yourself, all positive things. Some signs were 20 ways that you will know signs that you love yourself. Another website told me 40 signs. Uh, I thought, no, that's too much to read. And so I just began to look at some of these signs, and I, and I put them together. And these were some of the things that I came up with. Um, one of the first signs that you love yourself is 
You put yourself first. Okay? You must be first. Next sign. Um, you are free to be yourself. Please. My wife, my husband mustn't inhibit me. I'm free to be myself. Okay, next one. Um, you trust your abilities. Man, you've got to trust your own abilities. If you trust your ability, if you don't trust your abilities, how are you going to achieve anything in life? And you know when you love yourself, you will trust your abilities. Next one. Um, you forgive yourself. Come on, who doesn't mess up over here? Who doesn't make mistakes? And um, you know what? So now you've you got, you got to, when you are, are loving yourself, you love yourself enough to, hey, self, I forgive you for making that mistake. Don't look at me like that. Don't you do that. Okay, next one. You refuse to surround yourself with toxic people. Do you know toxic people? And I'm not talking about the toxicness only of drugs and of alcohol and all those kind of toxic. But man, some people are just so negative. Some people just break you down. Some people, when they walk in the room, you know what? Everything turns not long and it's not lack. And they're toxic people. And say, so, you know what? If you want to love yourself, get rid of toxic people. You don't mix with them. Isn't that good advice? If you want to love yourself, um, let's listen to the next one over here. These are just some of them that I picked up. You have to have a strong sense of purpose in life. Man. Um, you know what, if you don't love yourself, you'll be walking around in circles all the time. What must I do in life? And no, but having a strong sense of purpose. You get up in the morning, you know what you're going to do, you know where you're going to in life, you know what you want to achieve in life. Man, that is the sign that you love yourself. Doesn't it sound good? Right, next one. You celebrate success. You know, the, the, some people, you know, when success happens to them, um, they go and they go, oh, you know. Um, uh, no, a person that loves themselves, when they're successful, they will go, yes, 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 wow. And you know how to celebrate. Come, we're going to go a party now. We're going to celebrate success. Um, other than the very first one, how many of you look down that list and say, well, if I had some of those things in my life, I, I'd be a much better person? Hmm? Paul writes to the church, <laughs> he writes to a pastor by the name of Timothy, and he says to them, listen, Tim, in the last days, people are going to love themselves, and he's not talking in a positive way. And I know you sitting over here and you saying to me, but the Bible says you must love your as you love yourself. So you know what there, the Bible teaches me, Jesus teaches me to love myself. So, so what's um, Paul going on about? Uh, where's this whole business? Well, I, I've actually sat in church where, uh, in the full gospel church, where I've heard this taught. And I will not agree to it ever again. You see, you can say to yourself, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Or else you can go like this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And boy, oh boy, if the emphasis is on you, you've missed the point. The point is on your neighbor. Because Jesus was speaking about how we deal with neighbors. And neighbors isn't the person living next to you. Neighbor is the ones sitting next to you, five meters from you, like distancing, um, 
the people here in church, the people outside of church, the people at work. It's how we relate to these people. I look at that first one that we look at over there. Um, loving yourself is putting yourself first. And I don't know about you, but every now and again, love for myself comes knocking on my door. And you know what? Why must I always be second? Why must I always be nice to my wife? She must be nice to You missed the opportunity to say nothing. Um, why must other people push in front of the queue? Why must I wait at a four-way stop street and let other people go? And my blood starts boiling when they tail one another. You know, one car and the other one goes right behind them. And then I go, <laughs> And if it's a taxi... <laughs> Come on, how many of you don't, don't mind being in the background? Don't mind not having preferential treatment? I was speaking to somebody during the week, and um, they work for um, BMW, and um, Telling, uh, she was telling me how customers will come in and, um, you know, there's something wrong with the BM and uh, they will get the floor manager out over there and the floor manager gives them personalized attention, personalized attention and boom, boom, boom and um, tries to help and, and uh, two weeks time back over there and now the, the floor manager has got other work to do and now this person doesn't get the same treatment anymore and all of a sudden, on the floor of BMW, they throw their toys out the cot. Because they're not getting preferential treatment like they should be. Um, and if you really loved me, <laughs> you'd be looking after my BMW and after me, wouldn't you? We don't battle with these things. You are free to be yourself. Huh. I will not allow somebody to tell me what to do. I tell other people what to do. Oh, really? You know, there's a little scripture that says, be self-controlled. It doesn't only say be God-controlled. It says you be self-controlled. Controlled. Yeah, but I've got no control over my temper. I've got no control over my tongue. It just gets ahead of me. And then I can at least say um, to myself, please self forgive yourself for what you said. <laughs> we get sold this thing of being free to be yourself. But boy, how does that work in a marriage? How does that work in a family? How does that work when you're busy with children? Oh, I'm free to be myself. I can go out. I can just leave the baby at home. Somebody else is going to look after the child. No, sir. You're not free to be yourself. You've got responsibilities. And you can choose. Your responsibilities might be something that, you know, what you have. Uh, and that you feel towards your family, towards your child or whatever. But how about, how about this? What about your responsibility towards God? What about being controlled by the Holy Spirit? Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's goosebumps. No, it's not. That's not speaking in tongues. No, that is making a Spirit-controlled decision. How to behave, what to say, what to do, how to go about it. And you know what? You can look upon this world as, you know, now the world is trying to control us. I, I listen to some people talking, and you know what? Now the governments are controlling. Um, you know, we must wear masks, and we must do this, and all this control business. And yes, there's some truth in it. But man, the day they say 
oh, take the mask off, it's fine, the virus is away and everything got, we still sit with the virus of selfishness and sin in your heart. And you know what? We will sit with more problems. I'm amazed. I was looking at statistics during this week. And one of the statistics that really kind of shocked me was that during the lockdown, when we were in hard lockdown, there was no alcohol. Do you know that there were less deaths then? Even though they came along and they told us, no, there are so many people dying of COVID. But there were less deaths. You know why? Because there weren't people on the roads drunk, busy killing other people. There weren't people going around shooting others. There was less bed people in hospital because the hospitals didn't have to deal with family abuse caused by alcohol. And boy, I want to tell you now, virus can come and virus can go. But what are you going to do about your heart? Are you going to fall under this trap of loving yourself and being free to do what you want to do? Or are you going to get down on your knees and say, God, help me. I want to come under your influence. I want to come under your divine power to be able to do what you want me to do. I want to live by faith that will move mustard seed faith that will move the mountains. This little thing about forgiving yourself. If you've ever heard it preached that you must forgive yourself, please throw it away. Go find it in the Bible. If you've sinned, you've sinned against God. If I sin against Nolene and I say something to her that I should never say, first of all, I've done something against God because God loves and cares about her. And so I need to ask God for forgiveness and then I need to go to Nolene and say, Nolene, I'm sorry what I said. Oh, then you must forgive yourself. No. If you think you're so important, and you know what? This part of forgiving yourself is you become God, and you've got to be loved, and, and so you know what? You've sinned against your godness. Rubbish. Rubbish. You don't know the power of sin. If you've got to forgive yourself, you don't know the power of sin, and you don't know the joy of knowing God's forgiven me. Boy, oh boy, when you realize that you've sinned against God, you know the true depth of your sinfulness. You can hide it away from everybody else. You can act like, hey, you know, I'm here in church, and you know what, I'm this nice person, but God knows who you are. And when you've sinned, you've sinned against God. But, 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 but. When you ask Him for forgiveness, receive His forgiveness. Don't go and shortchange Him. He wants to forgive. He taught forgiveness. But He taught also that we must, He wants to forgive as we forgive others and not yourself. In other words, if you want to have an issue with somebody else, and, um, you know, that person has jewed you out of money and done this, uh, said this about you. And you come to God and say, Lord, please forgive you. I want to tell you now there's a finger pointing at you. And there's three pointing back at you saying, hey, go and forgive your brother first. And then come and ask God for forgiveness. It's getting very quiet here. Refuse to surround yourself with toxic people. Boy, believe me, there's a time and a place But I just want to say this to you. Jesus stepped into a toxic world. And He stepped into a toxic world with compassion in His heart. He said, they're sheep without a shepherd. Come on, disciples, we need laborers. We need to go and minister to these people. And you know what? When you start thinking of yourself, how the other people's toxicness can affect you, what about your toxicness affecting other people? 
There's only one God influence. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the love of God, when you're filled with compassion in your heart, you walk into toxic situations and you turn them around to the glory of God. We need to set an example. And we need to have the compassion of Christ. Man, that's rubbish. That we love ourselves so much that we want to get more love and more love. And and God must help me to love myself more. No, sir. You start loving others. You start having compassion. You start doing what God called you to do. Then you will see. You don't go argue about loving yourself. It's just something that happens. You can't hate yourself and say, I love God. You can't hate yourself and, and then go to somebody and say, hey, I love you. No, sir, you can't. But loving yourself, poof, full stop. No, sir. Having a strong sense of purpose. What is God's purpose for your life? You can sit down and believe me, I've done all these things where you, where you write down your weaknesses and your strengths and you sit and you look at this and you measure it and, and I've done all of those things. I'm finished with them. I will not do it again. i will rather spend my time finding out about what God's plan and God's purpose for my life is, but I'm not going to go around and saying, oh Lord, what's your plan and purpose for, your life, for my life? No, sir, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to do what He told me to do. Whether it's something small, something big, it doesn't matter. I will do what God's called me to do, and I will live in His purposes. I'm not going to go, oh, what's my purpose now? No, sir, God put me on this earth. God gave me two legs. God gave me two hands to do His purpose. God gave me a heart. And the most important thing about a purpose in life is having a right relationship with God. When you've got a right relationship with God, you're able to live out His purposes. The last thing that I saw over there on these lists, and many of them duplicated them, that's why I just threw some of them away, was you know how to celebrate success. Come on, we know how to celebrate uh, 21st, don't we? Um, we? We know how to celebrate Christmas, don't we? Um, we know how to celebrate a, a 50th birthday, a 40th birthday, and a 70th birthday. Uh, we, we know how to celebrate the birth of a, a grandchild, don't we? Uh, we know how to celebrate these things But I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to celebrate Jesus Christ? Do you know how to celebrate His death and His resurrection? Do you know how to celebrate that? Do you know how to celebrate with other brothers and sisters in praise and worship? Or do you come along to church and now we're going to praise and worship God? All of a sudden, you develop um, a very quiet voice. But man, when it's a, that friend of yours, 21st, and you've got a couple of hopper behind you, then all of a sudden... You can move like you've never moved before. And this tongue gets so loose and you can sing along and you can lift up your hands and wave and, and you can, ah, ha, ha. But now you're in church. I want to tell you, you're just a lover of yourself then. There's something much better than celebrating your successes and other people's successes. We need to do that, but it needs to be balanced with a celebration. Jesus! His power, His might, and who He is. Celebrating with a thankful heart. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. Coming before Him with thanksgiving in my heart. 
Oh, I've got a whole list of moans for him. Um, you know what? Uh, he didn't um, do this. My wife didn't do that. And my children are like that. And this church is like this. And my money is like this and that. Oh, come on. We need to present our requests to God. Yes, sir. But how about with thanksgiving in my heart? I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. My gladness doesn't come from my successes. My gladness doesn't come from, oh well, now my sports team won or whatever, or I won the lotto. I don't care about those things. Don't get involved with those. My successes are in Jesus. And I will celebrate with them. It's so easy. We looked at all those other people and said, I'll never follow a Moses of Crete. How stupid those people were. Well, you might not be sold to that, but maybe, just maybe, you've been sold the lie of loving yourself. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. In John 15, verse 13 to 14, greater love has no one than this, that he loves himself and his friends. Oh, is that the translation? That he lay down his life. In other words, I give my life for my friends. I give my life I lay down my life for my spouse. Matthew 16, verse 23 to 24, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wants to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for Me will find it. A man by the name of Jim Elliott was a missionary. He was one of the top students in his college. He was, and you can go watch the movie about this man. Um, he could have walked into many of the top churches in America in his day. But God had put it on his heart to go to Indian folk that didn't know Jesus in South America and with all his talent of intellect, of heart, off he and his friends went. And to cut a long story short, they were murdered by the very Indians that they were coming to minister to. But before this man left on his mission, he wrote these words. You might look at those words and you don't understand what he's busy saying. And I want to leave it there. I'm not going to explain it to you. But I want to tell you what this man is saying is very, very true.